stocks trade ranged in a three-day working week. Energy and industrials notched some gains while IT and financials drag pit caps outperform. Insurance regulator IRDAI's new surrender value rule significantly trimmed the proposed payouts and a big relief for life insurers who now only see a limited margin impact in select categories. Stocks of life insurers gain on this news. Mankind Pharma sees a near 3% of its equity change hands with uh, Chris Capital uh, owned Beige Limited likely exiting the company, while Adani Ports laps up a 95% stake in Gopalpur Ports for about 13.50 crores. Mankind slips while Adani Ports perks up. Veteran investor Ramdev Agarwal of Motilal Oswal says uh, to CNBC TV18 that he expects the Nifty index to double in the next five years, also unperturbed by the selling of stakes by promoters and private investors. Hello and welcome to Halftime Report on CNBC TV18. I'm Ikta Batra and uh, with me is Manglam Malu. Well, Manglam, it is a Tuesday, but it feels like a Monday and it's going to be uh, you know, the end of the week soon. But nonetheless, uh, the markets seem to be range bound probably for that purpose that, you know, maybe a lot of people have taken the week off and uh, extended their holidays. But as of now, we have the Nifty, which is quite range bound. That's probably why we have the mid caps, which are outperforming. So the mid cap index is up around eight tenths of a percent. What is disconcerting is that the advanced decline ratio could be better. So let's see whether that improves as the day goes on. Small caps also absolutely flat with a little bit of a positive bias as we speak. I take that point, Ekta. You know, it is a, a small week, but not definitely... It, it, rather, it's a short week, but a not, not a small one because we have uh, the Nifty uh, monthly expiry, expiry play out. And this time around, it's, of course, the last week of FY24 as well. So what exactly do the MFs do, uh, you know, the institutions do with regards to their positions? Typically, we see some sort of pump priming or NAV propping that happens towards the last few days of the week. And also because it is, uh, you know, the week of monthly expiry, we will have the Nifty Bank weekly options expiry play out on Thursday instead of Wednesday. So those are a bunch of factors that we'll be watching out for. The market, like you said, has been biding time, has recovered from the lows. So let's see whether we see some green on the index or not. It's been in a bit of a range. Uh, let's talk about a lot of stocks which are in focus. Diagnostic companies, we have Dr. Lal, Metropolis, uh, all of them buzzing in trade. Ekta, there's a positive brokerage note? Well, yes. Uh, you know, there is a positive bro brokerage note which has come in from Kotak uh, on um, Dr. Lal's where they've double upgraded Dr. Lal's from sell to add. They've raised the fair value to 2,360 odd rupees and raised the Metropolis fair value to 1,600, maintaining their reduced rating given the fair valuations they believe Metropolis has. Now, overall, their thesis on the diagnostic space is that there is increasing pricing sanity and diagnostics over the past one year. So the latest pricing exercise across seven cities suggests further improvement in pricing trends. Most large incumbents, according to them, have raised prices by 5% over the past one year. Now, Metropolis raises, uh, raised prices by 5% on, on a sequential basis recently. Agilis uh, raised prices across cities by 7% Q1, Q1, Q4. Pricing for Dr. Lal's, Thyrocare, Vijaya has remained the same largely. But like I mentioned, most of them have already taken price hikes over the past one year. Lupin hiked prices by 12% Q1, Q1, Q4. Aster DM met plus tweak pricing in Hyderabad by 1 to 3%. Apollo has not taken any significant pricing action according to Kota in FY24. But this is after raising prices by 2x earlier in the early part of FY24. So that's where the entire pricing scenario stands, which seems to be much better than earlier. Now, the pricing differential of listed incumbents with online players stays elevated, according to them, at around 2 to 2.6 times. According to them, overall, there's an increasingly benign competitive landscape which alleviates any major concerns on structural volume growth as well as margins of Dr. Lal's and Metropolis. So the benign uh, pricing scenario is boding well for them. All right, benign pricing scenario, less uh, competition is something or less competitive intensity is something that's doing well for them. But a special dividend is on the cards from uh, Indian Metals and Ferro Alloys. Uh, 
Nigel, tell us what's driving the stock. Well, that's right. Infa is buzzing in today's trading session because of a few factors. They announced rate late on Friday that in the next couple of days, that's on March 29th, they'll be meeting to pay out a special dividend. Why could they be possibly playing a special dividend out? Well, they were due for a compensation of the Utkal C coal block. And to that extent, they've received around 131 crores. But keep in mind, they're due to receive another 200 to around 250 crores. So it seems that some part of this money they want to return to the shareholders. Now, besides this dividend pay, and also fundamentally, the company has been talking about increasing their ferrochrome capacity by close to around 50%, 40-40% approximately, in the next few years. The fundamentally as well, things are looking up. And for quarter one, the margins could remain firm because ferrochrome prices globally have been... Uh, you know, fixed upwards. So that will be a good read through in terms of their selling price. And also coking coal costs have corrected by close to 10%. So that will be good on the margin front. So what's playing out on the margins and why things could look out fundamentally as well is because the higher ferrochrome prices, which is their selling cost, input costs, particularly coking coal costs is lower. And also they get their chrome ore from their own backyard, which is good news for them because the rest of the globe is struggling with higher chrome ore prices. Put all this together, the stock is high in today's trading session with a gain of around 5%. Okay, all right, uh, Nigel, thanks very much for that. But let's move on in a big relief for life insurance companies. Insurance regulator IRDAI has approved graded surrender value uh, for companies. Yash joins in with more details on this. Well, like that's certainly a big relief, as you said, and a major overhang out of the way for these life insurance companies. Uh, if you remember, in December 2023, the regulator had come out with a proposal which suggested higher surrender value, uh, which is to be paid by these life insurance companies to their policyholders in case of early surrenders. Uh, that became a big negative for these life insurance companies because the increase which was proposed was quite significant, almost double of what uh, you know surrender value is paid today. Now, after that, there was multiple back and forth between the industry and the regulatory body, uh, after which the final regulations on the surrender value came over the weekend. And as we had been reporting over quite some time now, uh, the final regulations have been quite watered in the favor of the life insurance industry when it comes to surrender value. Quickly, what is surrender value? It's the money which is paid by the life insurance company to the policyholder in case of early surrender. Now, what the life insurance uh, regulator has said is that if the policy is surrendered in the second year the surrender value will be 30 percent of the total premium in the third year it'll be 35 percent between the fourth and the seventh year it'll be 50 percent and in the last two years of the policy maturity it'll be 90 percent now these prices if you see up to the seventh year are almost the same in terms of surrender value as they exist today interestingly majority of the policies get surrendered before the seventh year which means the impact which life insurance companies face today will remain the same without any incremental negative coming on uh, to their balance sheet from increasing surrender value. Brokerages had estimated a 400 to 500 basis points impact on the VNB margins, which gets uh, largely negated at this point of time. Just to compare a few numbers, what was proposed and what came out, on a 1 lakh rupee premium annually, the second year surrender value which was proposed in the earlier draft was about 83,750. What has come out is just 30,000 uh, in terms of the final regulations. Look at the fourth year. What was proposed was 2.5 lakhs. What has come out is just 1.5 lakhs. Look at the sixth year. What was proposed was 4.19 lakhs. What has come out is just about 2.5 lakhs. Seventh year, again, what was proposed was about 5 lakhs. What has come out is just about 3 lakhs. So, of course, uh, a significant reduction in terms of what was proposed and what has come out in terms of surrender value, which is a big positive for these life insurance companies, specifically for HDFC Life and Max Life, which have a high exposure. Max Life is gaining largely in trade today because there's valuation support as well, along with the regulatory positive. Right, Yash, thanks a lot for that. So that explains uh, the move that we're seeing in a lot of these life insurance players. Uh, some other stocks which are in the news this uh, afternoon as well. Upasna is tracking the same. Upasna, tell us. Well, first up is... Uh, Hindustan Aeronauticals. Uh, the company gets order for the supply of Hindustan 228 aircrafts from Guana Def Defence Force and the contract value is almost 194 crores. That's the reason the stock remains in focus today. Next up is RBNL. The company signs an MOU with Airport Authorities of India. An MOU is basically for construction of subway in Kolkata and the estimated cost of the project is around 229 crores. Well, next up is Wellspun Corp. Well, the company has made two disclosures to the exchanges. On March 22nd, the company stated that it has announced mutual agreement with Aramco to stop and cancel 339 crore order 
with EPIC that is basically Eastern Pipes Integrated Company for the industry. And uh, next up is uh, on March 25th, the company has announced the contract sign off with Saline Water Conversion Corporation and the contract value is nearly about 512 crores. The contract is mainly for manufacturing and supply of steel pipes and the duration of the contract is about 30 months is what the company has indicated. That's the reason even Wellspun Corp remains in focus today. Okay. All right, Upasana. Thanks very much for that. Lot of stocks buzzing around today. Take a short break, but we have an exclusive conversation lined up with uh, the CEO of Tata, Starbucks. Stay tuned for that. Welcome back. Well, it's time for an important corporate conversation now. Uh, Mangalam, my co-anchor, caught up with Sushant Dash, uh, who's the CEO of Tata Starbucks, to get a sense of the company's financials, consumer preferences, and began by asking him how is the company likely to end this financial year. Listen in to excerpts from that conversation. So we should be good. Uh, as you said, the last two years for us has been about rapid expansion. If you look at it, uh, in the last two and a half years, we have nearly doubled our store count right. in three years' time. We did 50 stores, we then did 70 odd stores last year, and hopefully we'll break that number this year. Uh, we are 410 stores as we speak. We opened a new store this morning in Varanasi, uh, which also takes us to now, I think, 60 odd cities. So it is not just about the store expansion, it's also about the places that we have been to. Typically, Quick service restaurants do anywhere between 18 to 20 percent as EBITDA margins. Starbucks, we know, is profitable. So, what's the kind of EBITDA margins that you guys operate at? Again, I will not share numbers, but as you know, as you rightly said, we 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 became we we were cash profit for a while now. Yeah. We became profitable at an EBITDA level last year, which we declared, and I think that was something that was actually very. Uh, a sense of pride and in some ways it also gave us the confidence that we now know the model well because it was it came on the back of rapid expansion right. it came on the back of a contraction in the base numbers because of the previous two three years in terms of covid but irrespective of all of that to come back grow stores invest behind much higher number of stores and still uh, crack the profitability uh, parameter, I think, gave us the confidence that we now know uh, enough about this market and how where we want to go. But the rapid expansion plan is still on. You'll be opening one store every three days for the next two and a half years, as I can see. What's the kind of uh, investment that you're making per store? Roughly two and a half to three crore. Again, I will obviously not share numbers, but. For us, the store is what is most important. Uh, and we are proud of what we achieve in that. Having said that, we obviously understand the financial guardrails and we'll continue to have a strict control on that so that we continue to be profitable and you know get the right returns. How is the revenue mix of a store typically for Starbucks? What proportion comes in from hot beverages, how much of it comes in from cold beverages. We are speaking around summer right now, we right. launched a new product. Right. What proportion comes in from food and in that as well, how much is sweet, how much of it is savory? So, in terms of numbers, uh, if, I, if I look at it, it differs from season to season, as you yeah. said rightly. Uh, it also depends in terms of markets. You know, certain markets, in the initial stages we see, there is more preference for blended beverages, uh, which is our frappuccinos. Yeah. And as the market matures and there are more people who come in and understand coffee, there is a movement towards espresso, okay. right? So that is the typical pattern. So in that, in some sense, because Mumbai is the oldest market, we would have more of espresso drinkers here, and hence people having more of Americanos or uh, the lattes, the flat whites. We are a tea drinking nation. Coffee penetration is still 25% amongst among the effluent or people that we are going to. So we need to create the category. And when you are creating the category, the easier drink to have is a blended beverage or a frappuccino. So the reason why I ask you this question is because uh, 
I'm sure gross margins differ from category to category. So with you adding more stores, initial sales being from the blended category, is that good or bad for your margins? So, so I, I, I think, as I said, we now know what it takes to succeed. So we built it into our financial modeling in terms of how a market will mature and where, and obviously you have done enough in terms of the middle of the PNL and the COGS to ensure that irrespective of this mix changes and in terms of the dynamics, you still maintain your financial guard rails. The competition right now. I mean, at the premium end, there are these artisanal brands which are perceived to be at a much better coffee quality level. At the lower end, there are a lot of these brands which are rapidly expanding, some of them being funded recently as well. Above and beyond all of this, when people are expanding, your rentals increase, the availability of real estate for you to expand the way you want to decreases. Right. So first and foremost, I always believe competition is good. Uh, That's the, the motherhood statement that everyone makes before makes, speaking yes. about competition. Competition, right? And, and in our case, more so because, as I said, we have to grow the category. Right. If we, and and if you have more players who are doing interesting work, then the category will grow faster, and it's good for us. Uh, the second thing is, as long as we continue to do what we are good at and create our differentiator, I think we are in a good place. So we need to concentrate in terms of what makes us the brand we are and why we have been successful. So let's uh, talk about summer 2024 and FI25 itself. Uh, what is it that you're targeting? In terms of store opening, of course, we know the 1,000 store by FI28 sort of target. And that calculating the numbers would be around 3,000, 3,500 crores in terms of top line that time. Give us a glide path to that. I think we will continue to do in many ways what we have been doing. Uh, as you rightly said, we'll continue to expand, we'll continue to grow stores, and I think we'll continue to grow stores both by opening newer markets and in terms of continuing to open in the markets that we exist. So that is the store expansion plan, and as we have already stated, by 2028, we will be uh, a thousand stores. Uh, we today have around 4,000 odd partners, 4,300 partners. We will double that. We will be at 8,600, 8,700 partners. Mm. We will continue to innovate a lot more in terms of food. What proportion currently comes in from food? Uh, in terms of uh, our food would be around 17-18% of, of our mix right now. Food attach is important for us. and. There's a lot of work that has gone in, in terms of how we look at it and what we need to do, understanding from a consumer point of view. So you will see a lot more of innovation in terms of food. Uh, we will see more beverages. Uh, okay. that, that, and we keep launching beverages. Refreshers is a uh, clear indication. We will see how, what more we can do. We will also start to celebrate Indian occasions more. We will now have a more 360 degree approach to Indian and community festivals. Uh, so, so those are some of the things, and digital. How many more reserves are you planning to open this year? That is, that is, that is good. So reserves, uh, you know, in terms of reserves, we converted our first store fort to a reserve, uh, and it has given us good traction, good result. Uh, so we will do more of that. Uh, we hope to do two more uh, in the coming year. Uh, we, 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 we will, we, we are still figuring that out, but. Delhi, Mumbai are prime considerations as of now. You are on track to do 1,000 stores by 2028. The current revenue run rate per store continues into 2028 as well. When you have 1,000 stores, the operating leverage uh, will start to kick in because now you've uh, figured out the model of success out here. And with all of this, you will continue to maintain your leadership in the market as it were. Is, uh, would that be a... That would be a fair assessment. Right, that was some insightful conversation coming in from the CEO of Tata Starbucks, part of the listed entity of Tata Consumer, uh, saying that they will double their store count every uh, uh, in, in the next uh, three years or so from 410 to over 1,000. Importantly, they will focus on food and launch a lot of uh, new non-coffee refreshers as well. But the person next to me is an avid coffee drinker. Rekta, what do you make? Well, absolutely. You know, I, I was completely uh, uh, taken by the conversation there, but I was more intrigued by knowing what you all were drinking because that didn't look like coffee. That was actually a coffee-based drink without oh. the taste of coffee. It was some, some of the summer refresher beverages that they had, uh, you know, recently launched. So how this much one... do they get from non-coffee drinks? Currently, they said, like, uh, you know, Sushant said, at the start yeah. of a show, a uh, start of a store, rather, 
a lot of the beverages that comes in or a lot of the revenue that comes in is from non-coffee or blended beverages. Blended. And as markets mature, people move towards the Americanos and Espressos. So maybe if they were to plot a scale, it would start from me and it would end at you. I would be the absolute non-coffee drinker starting out with all these <laughs> with summer the refreshers beverage. and then as they mature they go on to americanos and espressos okay well interesting to see and let's see how they localize and whether they have filter coffee there soon or not but uh, nonetheless that is uh, starbucks for you and we'll get you more of that conversation as we go through the day we'll take a short break but we'll turn to technicals on the other side stay tuned Welcome back. Uh, even as the market's biding its time in a range, it's moved off lows and that's a good thing. The mid-cap index has done a lot better. It's up around eight-tenths of a percent. Uh, so we'll just keep an eye out on how the market goes because as of now, what we're looking at is a range-bound screen with the India WIX moving higher. The mid-cap index at an index level is outperforming, is at the high point. But all of this, you know, uh, looks at an advanced decline ratio, which is twice in favor of declines than the number of stocks which are advancing. So we have just about 800 stocks in the green for about 1,600 stocks which are in the red itself. So that's something we'll have to monitor as we go along this week itself. Important week because it is uh, the monthly options expiry or the monthly expiry week for all the futures and options for the March series. And in that, uh, <coughs> the street believes that this range will continue as well. If you look at the Nifty options, 22,000 put is extremely active. On the way up, we have the 22,200 call, which is equally active. What does that tell you? That the street believes that the market will be between this uh, 22,000 to 22,200 range. And that is, uh, you know, pretty congruent with the technical levels that we're looking at as well. On the way up, it's the 20-day moving average on the Nifty, which will be a bit of a resistance, which is, again, closing in towards that 22,200 mark. At the lower level, just 50 points below 22,000 is the 50-day moving average, which has proven to be an important support for the frontline index as well. And not just the Nifty, similar is the range that we're looking at for the Nifty Bank as well, 46,400 to around 46,900 on the way up. Uh, important to watch out for which way the financial Nifty uh, moves today. It's between that 20,000, uh, uh, 700 and 20,750 mark. On the way up, 20,750 call is extremely active. So if it crosses past that, we may see some short covering. If not, then it is this range that we're looking at, 20,700 to 20,750. Stocks in focus, Indus Tower and Nalco entered FNO ban once again. And uh, stocks which may exit FNO ban would include the likes of Biocon, Tata Chem and Z Entertainment. So those are a bunch of uh, stocks on our radar. Okay, all right, Mangdam, thanks very much for that. So that's the update coming in from the entire FNO setup today. Sachitanand Uttekar of Trade Bulls joins in to discuss the technicals on the show now. Sachitanand, hi, welcome to the show. Well, what Mangdam was pointing out is that the advanced decline ratio today is negative despite some amount of resilience in the mid caps. How would you approach trade um, in such a setup? Uh, good afternoon, Ekta, and good afternoon, Mangdam. Uh, as as we clearly described, you know the range is uh, quite clear. That 22,200 on the higher side uh, looks like a difficult uh, you know level to negotiate. Whereas on the lower side, uh, there is a good durable support somewhere close to around 20, 21,930. So I think until unless uh, Nifty remains in this particular range, we may not see any uh, major directional change. On the contrary, in fact, if you look at some of the technical indicators, uh, both the indices, uh, Nifty and the Nifty Bank, have been trending. Uh, below their uh, five-week exponential moving averages. So I think these particular levels would be critical for the week. When it comes to Nifty, uh, the level is placed somewhere close to around 22,110. So until unless we don't see a decisive breakout above this particular range uh, uh, level, uh, we may not see uh, you know a, a, a good amount of confidence in the bullish rally. So probably we may see uh, you know, Nifty uh, facing some kind of a resistance uh, whenever it moves towards that particular level. Uh, when we look at Nifty Bank, uh, the corresponding level is placed somewhere close to around 46,830. So until unless we don't see a decisive closing about that, probably uh, even here uh, Nifty Bank may continue to you know uh, display some pressure. So I think uh, uh, both the indices uh, may remain locked within this particular range. At least for today's session, uh, we don't see any major change. But going forward, I think these levels will be critical. But until unless uh, uh, the, the, the the breakouts are not displayed, I think uh, it's a good classic uh, salon rise kind of a setup, wherein one needs to be very cautious while picking any any particular you know uh, trade on the long side. 
So that's why I think better to keep a long shot ratio and trend, uh, trade the market accordingly. All right, keep a long shot ratio. What would the long shot ratio be according to you and individual stocks, what would you do? Well, Mangalam, I think uh, Bajaj FinServe has displayed a good, uh, strong, uh, you know, comeback. Uh, we have seen a good floor at around uh, 15, 70, 15, 80 kind of a mark. And uh, today's, uh, you know, action is displaying a short covering kind of a setup. If you look at the price action uh, for the last three weeks, uh, we saw a kind of a symmetrical triangle and that particular triangle has been breached. So probably, you know, this particular stock may display or continue to display outperformance. If you look at technically, uh, this particular rally may uh, conclude towards 1670. And that's why we are recommending, you know, building long positions here, uh, keeping a stop loss somewhere close to around 1610 uh, on a closing basis. And on the short side, I think uh, uh, Bharti Airtel uh, has uh, been in a very strong bull run, but uh, of, uh, for the last couple of trading sessions, we have seen a fair amount of supply pressure at around 1240, uh, you know, 1230 kind of a zone. Uh, if you look at the uh, daily RSI again here, there's, uh, there are signs of a diversion here. So probably, you know, uh, we may see some slippages uh, uh, to, uh, in this particular counter. Uh, we may see uh, see this stock uh, you know, slipping towards its 20 day exponential moving average support, which is placed somewhere close to around 11.95. So, with that target in mind, uh, we have recommended uh, you know, shorting this particular uh, counter to our clients. From a future perspective, one can keep a stop loss somewhere close to around 12.36 uh, and uh, you know, review uh, their positions uh, once the stock starts trending towards that 12.11.95 kind of a zone. Okay. All right, Sachidanand. We're going to leave it on that note. Thanks very much for joining in and giving us those strategies. I uh, just want to point out that a couple of these stocks, such as, say, a Brigade Enterprises, is down around 4-odd percent. So that one's trending a little lower. We have a couple of other stocks, such as Delivery also, which is a bit sluggish today. That stock has done well on a year-to-date basis. It's up around 15-odd percent, but it's losing out a little bit in today's trade. GM Financial, IFL Securities, both these stocks have been under the weather on account of news, uh, both the stocks are down and out today as well. Well, we need to take a short break, but we have a big announcement to share with you all. We're launching CNBC TV 18's first ever live personal finance webinar, CNBC TV 18 Accelerate Personal Finance Handbook with Sonia Shinoy, where she will be joined by three well-known experts on Saturday, 11th May, 9 a.m. onwards. We'll be diving into everything you need to know to master your finances and learn how to grow your wealth be it insurance, tax saving, managing your portfolio, retirement planning. There's a lot to learn and lots to do. Whether you're in your 20s, 30s or even 40s, this live webinar is for you. We have limited seats, so don't miss this chance. Register now. Scan the QR code to register or log on to cnbctv18.com and we will see you on the 11th of May. Welcome back. Uh, well, for the markets, it's quite quiet on the frontline indices, except for specific stocks. So specific stock action continues. From the Nifty space, we have Power Grid, which is now the top loser on the Nifty. So that stock is down around 2-odd percent. Aisha, Wipro, SBI, Life are also following suit. But let's talk about one particular Nifty company. That's Dr. Reddy's. That stock is down around 0.3 percent. Now, that uh, particular stock is in focus because Amnil, which is a pharma company, has received USFT approval for the generic version of Ciprodex, which is basically a drug. Uh, Ciprodex is a combination of an antibiotic as well as a steroid and it is used for ear infections. Now, Dr. Reddy's is already selling this particular generic version of this of Ciprodex in the US markets. So they already have around 30% market share. So that means that uh, with Amni launching the drug, there is a possibility that they're going to face competition. Ciprodex generic, uh, what Dr. Reddy's currently generates from it is around 30 to $40 million. And According to Andis, as of now, it could probably see an impact of 15 to $20 million because of competition from Amnil. But uh, generally, when this kind of news is a, is a surprise to the markets, you will probably see a sharper reaction to the stock. You're not seeing as sharp a reaction because, the uh, one, there is expectation that, yes, competition will come in into drugs. And secondly, uh, Dr. Reddy's has a diverse base. Uh, Manglam, when it comes to, you know, it has a diverse base mm. when it comes to drugs in the US now. And hence, maybe this would dent it 
but it's not going to put a you it's not really going to damage the us sales for dr reddy's so hence you're not seeing that much of a stock reaction come in for dr reddy's and as you can see the stock is down around 2 tenths to 3 tenths of a percent but let's um, now move away from pharmaceuticals and uh, put the focus on paints the paints industry which re recently witnessed a disruption because of the entry of the birlas manglam is here to give us the latest on the anatomy series on what goes into the making of paints and the paints industry have a look getting a house painted it's so taxing ain't it what's more boring is watching paint dry but tell you what let's make paints a little more interesting for you that can of paints that comes to your house when your house is getting painted you don't know what's inside it right so let's tell you the anatomy of a paint can and the paint sector in india so that humble paint can that you see out there has all the magical colors but those colors are made of titanium dioxide 15 to 20% of that box comes from titanium dioxide higher the premiumness of the paint more the composition of TiO2 itself then you have 20 to 25% coming in from solvents monomers a lot of chemicals and additives that are derived from crude itself that's crude oil that i'm talking about and then you have another 8 to 10% of some more of those chemicals to add magic to those paints so basically a can of paint will have 30 to 32% contribution coming in from crude related inputs and that increasingly is reducing largely because a lot of the companies are making water based paints as well so that makes majority of the composition of that paint can to package that paint can and to advertise that paint can and to take the paint can to the stores itself and then sell to you what are the other costs that are there well packaging and logistics would be about 5% each so add that to 10% then you have the dealership margins the channels that are there anywhere between 5 to 15% and anywhere between 5 to 10% are the advertising and marketing spends so that make up another 15 to 20% and that leaves you with another 15 to 20% you'd wonder what that 15 to 20% is well there is nothing but the ebitda margins of paint companies so there you have it 100% paint the anatomy of a paint can while that is 100% paint that's not the 100% of your paint cost so let's tell you more what was a 100% paint that i just spoke to you about is actually only 50% of your cost what is the other 50% you might ask it is the labor the cost that it takes for you to paint your house you would say 50% you know what you're actually lucky because globally this number is actually 90% currently 50% of the expenditure of painting a property is labor 20 years ago that was 30% 10 years ago that was 40% and as the nation develops the cost of labor increases you will see the cost or contribution of labor to the overall cost of painting increase further as well and that's why in global nations or developed nations you see this culture of diy paintings and that's why the frequency of painting is a lot higher as well in india a person paints their house once in 5 to 7 years whereas globally this number could be as high as twice in a year because they paint just one wall in their houses themselves so the cost of labor is extremely crucial for calculating the overall demand for paint as well because paint prices may go up or go down but if the cost of labor keeps increasing then the demand for paint may get impacted so now that you know about what goes into a can of paint and also know what it costs to paint your house it's important to know about the paint industry itself the paint industry in india is close to around 80000 crores of which organized is 65000 crores it's growing between 11 to 13% and if you look at the bifurcation of the paint industry nearly 2/3 comes in from economy and mid priced whereas 1/3 comes in from premium itself among the players that are there in the industry you have the large players the asian paints the berger paints the kansai nerolag the indico paints itself but importantly it's asian paints and berger paints which put together have more than 50% share in the paint market itself if you look at the capacity differences as well asian paints is close to 1.8 million kiloliters per year 
Then you have Aditya Birla, which just announced post its capacity expansion will be 1.3 million kiloliters per year. Following that is Berger, 1.2 million kiloliters per year. And then you have the following in the form of Kansai Nerolac, Indigo Paints and the others that have also uh, pointed or spoken about a lot of capex. What's important is the reach of all these paint companies as well. Most of them reach a lot of the dealers, but some of them, like Asian Paints, reach over 1.5 lakh dealers in the country. Birlas are targeting almost 50,000 dealers by the end of the first year of their operations itself. It's not just dealers that matter. What really matters is the kind of tinting machines that these dealers have. What is a tinting machine? Well, it's the machine that allows dealers to give you the shade of your choice without actually having the stock and making it ready in front of you. So in terms of tinting machines as well, you'll have the data of all the top players and the number of tinting machines that they have at their stores. Why this is important? Because it takes space on the shop floor of a paint dealer and it costs over a lakh per tinting machine for these companies to install them at the dealer's places itself. The paint industry is indeed exciting and there's a lot happening because a lot of people expect that the painting cycle will reduce going forward and demand will increase, especially at the premium end of things. Thank you for watching. That was the anatomy of the paint industry. Okay, definitely painting the town red <laughs> <laughs> and pink and green, uh, but definitely very interesting uh, anatomy of the entire paint industry, uh, Magda. What's next? What's next? Let's see <laughs> what next is. What is the next place of disruption? But, you know, I learned a lot about mm -hmm. what goes into a can of paint, paint and how much it costs to actually paint your house, how this industry is. So I was just happy to learn so much and as a result of it, uh, got that output as well. But important part is now with Birla's coming in, the what kind of disruption is what we're going to see. Speaking of that, actually, we have the numbers of RK Swami at the bottom of your screen, a recent listing from the media space, uh, net profits up 17%. We have a revenue decline of about 5%. The company during its IPO had told us that, you know, they are uh, looking at nearly 60% of their numbers coming in the second half of this year. So as a result of which, despite a revenue dip of 5%, the EBITDA has increased by 9%, telling you that the margins have improved. The stock has seen a bit of an up uptick, uh, still a lot below the issue price of a little over 200 rupees itself, uh, over 300 rupees itself, beg your pardon. So we'll keep an eye out on how that pans out. With that, uh, take a short break and also take a break on the equity market coverage. On the other side, we have Manisha Gupta joining in with All Things Commodities. Welcome back and joining us is a very special guest, Jayan Mehta from Amul. Mr. Mehta, hi. Congratulations are in place as you foray into the U.S. market. So while you do export to 50 countries, but this is the first time ever that Amul will be marketing, branding its milk out of India, and that is in U.S. First of all, happy holy to you and uh, all the viewers. Uh, this uh, is a new foray for us uh, for the first time. We are launching fresh milk in the U.S. Uh, Amul has been exporting Amul butter, cheese, ghee, shrikhand and all the dairy products to USA for the last 25 years and uh, to more than 50 countries over the last 50 years. But uh, this is the first time we realized that there's an opportunity for us to get into the fresh milk space in the US. And when I say fresh products, it means milk also. We are starting with uh, our Indian uh, recipe of Amul gold with 6% fat, Amul shakti, 4.5% fat, taza, 3% fat, uh, and slim and trim, which is 2% fat. And soon, uh, Amul buttermilk, Amul masti dahi, Amul paneer, and the range of fresh products will also follow. Uh, this is uh, to deeply penetrate into the market with the fresh product range. And US, as you know, is the uh, very big uh, dairy market. And uh, we have a large Indian and Asian diaspora. So that's why we identified MMPA, uh, a Michigan-based 108-year-old dairy cooperative, uh, which is among the top 10 dairy cooperatives in the US to partner with us to manufacture the, this uh, range of products at their uh, dairy plant with the state of art technology, which we will start distribution in the entire uh, East Coast as well as Midwest to almost around up to Texas markets. 
All right. So, Mr. Mehta, while you're exporting your products and you'll be making them there as well, so you are you going to be competing with yourself there? That's one. And two, how are these products which you procure and brand there itself going to be priced? There are two ways to looking at it. A, it's a very competitive market. So, I'm sure we're going to get the best price for milk there. B, uh, we are selling a product which is actually not available or never ever been sold to in the US market, which is a milk with 6% milk fat. So this is the Amul Gold pack, which with the same pack design product recipe uh, that you have in India will be available there. So obviously this will be premium priced. Uh, so we, we are not looking at a price competition there. We are looking at creating a brand and deriving value out of the proposition we give in the products that we offer to our customers. Mm. Mr. Mehta, with US done, or I mean, are you in process of doing it? And as you said, you'll be looking at more regions within US. You'll be looking at more products in US as well. Can we now safely assume that you are looking at other countries apart from US as well? Yes, I can say that uh, because uh, the US is very important and that's how we started into that market. There are a few other regions where we are actively pursuing such opportunities. And uh, very soon, hopefully, we should be revealing uh, their names and the status of the association. All right, we look forward to that. So one more question. This is about the volumes of fresh milk in US. I mean, I'm sure you've done your research and study there. So what is it that the market that you're looking to capture and what is the per capita consumption of milk in US as of now? Uh, typically, when we do market assessment, it's on per capita consumption basis. And uh, US typically, every household consumes 75 to 100 gallons. Uh, a year, which is uh, two gallons per week. So it's it's pretty pretty good consumption of milk uh, and milk products, as you may call them. So I think, uh, to be fair enough, it's in the first quarter, we will just uh, focus on uh, expanding the distribution, making the product available at all the Indian grocery stores, uh, the supermarket chains, uh, or possibly also tying up with the mainstream, uh, some of the chains which do sell large volumes of milk. And maybe after three months, I'll be able to come back with you with very realistic market estimates, not just for milk, but also for the other products like the buttermilk, etc. All right, Mr. Mehta, thank you so much for that exclusive conversation. So clearly, Amul foraying into US and looking at other geographies, other countries as well, where they would be not just exporting, but also looking to procure and market it from there itself. Well, Manisha, given the kind of uh, Indian uh, you know, diaspora, diaspora <laughs> around the world right now, this and the kind of love that Indian consumers have with a brand like Amul, I'm, I'm sure it's a... Uh, it's going to be a great business prospect Absolutely. for everyone And as, as you well. said, it's going to be a pr premiumly priced product. But even with that, I'm sure there are takers. Well, there will be takers for a taste as good as <laughs> Amul. Uh, a bunch of my friends, you know, you you you, you uh, go to their countries, you ask them, what is it the one thing that you miss? They say they miss the taste of Amul. <laughs> so, <India>. yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's see that how, how, how that pans out. Uh, take a short break, come back anymore in the markets and a lot of individual stocks. Welcome back. Well, Avenue Supermarts is up nearly 5% after ICICI Securities has upgraded the stock uh, to an ad. The brokerage has also raised the target price. Uh, Manglam, tell us why. Well, uh, the key reason why they believe it is an outperformer from here on for the near to medium term is because, one, the valuation premium over other listed FMCG companies has moderated. Secondly, all the bad news is in the price. And thirdly, despite uh, scaled down revenue growth that the company has done over the last three years, it's still higher than all the other parts of the FMCG business itself. So that's why ICICI Securities has upgraded the stock from hold to add, increased their target price from 4,100 rupees to 4,800 rupees as well. And in doing so, they've also upped their EPS estimates over uh, you know the next couple of years by 2 to 4%. They've compared the valuation premium of uh, Avenue Supermarts over Nestle. And as per their model, you know over the last couple of years, the valuation premium at one point, which was over 50%, has moderated to a little over 8% itself right now. And that makes it a comfortable space for them to say that DMART may outperform Nestle going forward. And uh, the data is uh, right in front where they expect, you know, 18 to 20% sort of revenue CAGR that the company has done over the last three years to continue, which will still be higher than the FMCG industry. The business risk has uh, low downside right now. And at the same time, the net profit margins for the company, despite weaker assortment has stayed healthy as compared to other FMCG peers. On the other hand, they maintain their hold rating on Nestle and they believe that Nestle's outperformance may wane going forward largely because 
One, uh, you know, the stock has risen about 35% over the last 12 months. And secondly, the revenue outperformance that Nestle had over the last 8 to 10 quarters in the FMCG space will now start to moderate largely because price hikes are in the base. So maybe, you know, the growth will be more volume-led as against price-led and as a result of which, which will be largely in line with the other FMCG peers. Okay, all right. Uh, well, that is on Avenue Supermarts, but Interglobe Aviation has also hit a 52-week high and surged after the brokerage UBS has raised the target price from 3,900 to 4,000 rupees. Soon as tracking this, she's here with more. Well, yes, uh, higher in trade today, 4% almost. Uh, the takeaway, the biggest one was that, that they plan to double by calendar year 2030. This is through more planes, through more geographies, including international routes and more destinations as well. What the company says is that their fleet addition continued with eight more planes in the month of uh, Jan and February, taking the total fleet to 366. And from FI25, they plan to add one plane every week. And that is a big number, which talks about big capacity coming in for Indigo itself. Itself. Management believes that the recent slowdown that they saw in passenger growth or passenger addition uh, as per the DGCA website is more supply-led but the demand continues to be very strong. New airports in Noida and Navi Mumbai that will come by in the next two calendar years will aid growth as well. The new guidance for FY25 for average seat per kilometer per passenger growth is at 11 to 12 percent. On the back of this, Jefferies has uh, upgraded the stock to a hold from an underperform. They've upgraded their yields uh, uh, targets also by 2 percent, the EBITDA estimates by around 14 to 16 percent. Motila Loswal, on the other hand, they have reiterated their neutral rating, have a target price of 3,510 rupees a share. They think the competition in the sector is expected to intensify with the resurgence of Air India and the entry of new so they continue to be neutral on the stock. Okay, all right, Sunil, thanks very much for that. So that's on Interglobe Aviation. Just want to point out that for the markets, that trend continues. So it's very range-bound on the index level, just about holding 22,000 for the Nifty, the mid-cap index managing to hold its head above the water decently. So up around 8 tenths of percent currently for the mid-cap index. Well, with that, it's a wrap on Halftime Report. Business Lunch will take all of the action ahead. Stay tuned.